Welcome everyone. This is the Valente Brothers podcast. I'm here with Pedro Valente. It's very nice to be here once again. Let's have a great podcast. And Joaquim Valente. Hello everyone. Happy to be here. So after a long summer break, <laughs> we're back and we're here to finalize the third episode now of the 753 and we're going to talk about the three what are the three pedro awareness balance and flow they have to do with mental wellness with the mind and why are they so important because the 753 code is a is a holistic approach to life it's a holistic philosophy And we believe that we have to tackle all three elements of our existence. The spiritual element, the physical element, and the mental element. And our minds are extremely important. And the three words have to do with awareness, which is extremely important. Mindfulness, learning to be present. It has to do with balance, emotional balance, how to properly maintain an optimal emotional state to go through life, and especially to deal with the struggles of life. And then flow, which has to do with our subconscious mind, how to program our subconscious mind to be able to act in our favor rather than against us. What is the main difference between mind and spirit? Spiritual, the spiritual essence of our existence has to do with everything that is not material. So people can interpret spirituality in different ways. Many people interpret spirituality as a connection with a higher being, with an intelligence force, intelligent force. But others interpret spirituality as living life for a higher purpose other than material benefit. To make it simple, striving to be a good person. So it has to do with ethics. It has to do with morality. It has to do with the decisions we have to make on a daily basis. And that's how we strengthen our spirituality. By being a good person. Someone who is helpful to fellow human beings. Someone who is unselfish. But someone who also has a, a healthy level of self-respect and who takes care of their health, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Joaquin, would you like to add? No, I think uh, this is a great topic. You know, sometimes when we explain the 753 code to students and to people that are listening for the first time what the 753 code is, they usually question this, the connection between spirit and and mind and uh, and it's interesting because it's a concept that we hear quite often right mind body and spirit and and i think you know being able to dive deeper and uh, you know these podcasts that we've been doing have really been making people more conscious on on how they can improve on, on the mind the body and the spirit in in actions that are connected to their daily life to their routines which is really the only way that you're going to be able to see an improvement over a period of time. So why is honor part of the spiritual element and not the mental or the mind element? For because example. I, because as I said, obviously these things can be interchangeable. Like positivity can be mind instead of body. But one of the most important quotes for me, I think is by Virgil, is the greatest wealth is health. And I think he's referring to health of the body because the body is the vehicle through which we go through our existence on this planet. And without a healthy body, we cannot achieve anything. We just can't. It's like a car that is broken. You can't move. So we need to make sure that our spiritual essence and our mental essence are promoting the health of the body. And so honor has to do with what? Has to do with 
the combination of our actions and our decisions that we make on a daily basis to make sure that in the end we are satisfied with how we're living our life. Because honor to me has, 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 is about the connection between your beliefs and how you act. So that you don't feel guilt, so that you don't feel shame, which are some of the most destructive emotional feelings that exist. So the spiritual essence of the 753 code has to do with honor above all, I would say. Because when you have rectitude, when you have courage, when you have benevolence, when you have respect, when you have honesty, when you have loyalty, you create a, a sense of an honorable life. And that creates a healthy mind and a healthy body. But to me, it is more, more connected with this, with this goal of making our spirituality, our spiritual life as strong as possible. And that comes through an honorable life. But, the, but don't you think that to be able to achieve that, both on the spiritual and on the body, you need to have a specific mindset that is achieved through the three that we're going to talk about today. 100%. 100%. Absolutely. We can debate here forever which one is more important, if it's the mind, if it's the body. And I think that's a very nice conversation because, yes, I agree with you, without a balanced mind, without mindfulness, without a healthy subconscious mind, it is very difficult to live a positive life. A sp and especially with awareness. Yeah, but hold on. Let's keep the podcast organized, right? <laughs> let's now talk about, so let's talk about yeah. the three. Let's start so the with first one. awareness. Should we start with awareness or with flow? Because re recently you said that maybe even though there's not a specific order, you said that possibly... Flow should be discussed initially, but let's, let's stick, say, let's to, stick the, with awareness. Yes. to the to the booklet. So awareness, which is zanshin. Yes. So awareness is mindfulness. That's a word that has been used recently a lot, and it is a, it is common knowledge that living in the past creates depression, and living in the future creates anxiety. Many times, we are not focusing on the now where we might be experiencing a very positive moment and we are feeling distress because we are not, we're living in the past or we're living in the future. We're worrying about things that might not ever happen and also we are continuing to think about events that already passed and that are no longer... So being aware, being present, living the moment, I think that's what and being Zanshin is, even though, like we have discussed before, these all come from the Japanese language, these all come from kanji, and it is very difficult to translate these kanji into our language, and just in a few words. These are very deep yeah. Um, terms. The term Zanshin has, as you said, very difficult to, to describe, to, especially with one word, but it has its remaining spirit, meaning remains. You stay here, you're here. You're not going somewhere else. You stay in this place. Which is so important right now, right? We catch ourselves through technology and through the, the, the speed sometimes of, of life today. And many times because of technology i think that's one of the main reasons for it we are constantly living others lives or like you said the past the present we have so much information the access to information is so immense that it becomes difficult to to live the moment mm -hmm. the small things that yes. are so important but also zanshin has also to do with readiness right so it's a combination of being aware, of being present, but of being prepared. Yeah. I like to d divide it into situational awareness, which is awareness of the present moment, being alert, knowing exactly what's happening. You have to be conscious, conscient of what's going on, conscious of what's going on right now. And also informational awareness. Be aware of information, information that you find in books, 
information that you learn from other people, being able to listen and pay attention when someone is talking to you so you can learn. So it has to do with the act of learning because readiness comes through awareness of information, comes from knowledge. So yeah, you have to, you have to be able to open yourself to what you don't know. And I think Zanshin really addresses that. Sometimes even when we talk about the different terms in the philosophy, like Shoshin, Correct. Which is a beginner's mind, such an important word also. But Zanshin in many ways, for us, our interpretation motivates one to always learn, to always be humble that we have more to learn. Yes, and I think Shoshin in its essence is Zanshin. Because what is a beginner's mind? It's a mind that is open to information. And how are you going to be open to information? By being present. If you're not present, a person who is not open is a person who thinks they already know that when you're talking to them, and then they focus on something else. They're not really paying attention because they think they know. So in order for you to learn and to be in a state which Shoshin presents, the beginner's mind, you need to be in a state of Zanshin, in a mindful state, in a present state. Joaquin, talk to us a little bit about how Zanshin also pushes us to live a more prepared life. What is your um, interpretation of how Zanshin teaches us that concept? I think exactly because of the beginner's mind. Because if you're constantly looking to be able to seek information and uh, understand everything that's around you to a deeper in a deeper way, that gives you a, a very calm state of mind that you can be in. And that's why I think you're so connected. Because when you think of fear, the biggest fear is usually because of the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to be the outcome. We don't know why we're going through this. And through knowledge, if we think of fear of flying, if you think of fear of the ocean, if you think of fear of being in the water, if you think of fear of the dark, if you take the most common fears that people have, through knowledge and through understanding and through um, bringing yourself to a higher conscious state of that situation, that fear starts to disappear. You start to be able to, um, to understand the different outcomes that could happen and to have the confidence level that you're prepared to be able to deal with those situations. And that's what gives you the ability to be able to deal with fear in the best way possible. Yeah, I think that in a very simple way to look at it, if you take, for example, school, grade school, university, Zanshin is doing your homework, right? Preparing. And the best way to do your homework, the best way to prepare is to do it on a consistent basis, to do it daily. So that by the time you get to the end of the semester, and you have to take your final exams, you're ready. You don't have to cram. You don't have to go crazy into a state of fear, like Joaquin just said. So we have to try to apply Zanshin, the aspect of preparedness, to our daily lives. Whatever it might be that causes fear or that has um, a potential for it to be a problem, we should find ways through knowledge to deal with it and to learn. But that's only possible if we are willing to deal with discomfort. Because if we fear something or if we want to learn something new, we're going to fail. It's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to feel like we don't know, you know what we're doing. We're going to feel that, especially if it's in an environment where there's other people, that there's going to be other people that do that better than us. And we're in the bottom. Yeah, it depends on the teachers also. Maybe you have some good teachers that help minimize but, that. But, but even yeah. if the teacher is very good, I'm telling you, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Because if it's not uncomfortable, then you're not improving. Well, there is a what, about, what about youth um, education? I think that I understand exactly what you're saying, but it doesn't have to be so No, I'm not saying so negative. uncomfortable. There's yeah. ways for you to make it better. But there's still a certain level of discomfort. Yeah. And that level of discomfort is necessary for you to be able to improve. Yeah, and when it comes and when it comes to sometimes. education, I think that you need to know each student so that you apply that level of discomfort when they're ready. Yes. 
I and, think that, and at different levels. Yeah, at, at different at, levels. At I some point, you're going to have less discomfort. At other right. times, you're going to have more discomfort. But I think if there's no discomfort, it's very hard for you to improve. Yes, I, this reminds me of the lobster, right? And, and how the lobster grows. The lobster, the shell of the lobster doesn't grow. So the lobster initially is very comfortable inside the shell. And then it gets to a point where it becomes uncomfortable to be in that shell. And then the lobster starts moving in a certain way that breaks the shell. Without the discomfort of being too tight inside that shell, the lobster would not have to break the shell. And, and breaking the shell is what allows the lobster to continue to grow. And then eventually a new shell is formed and the same process happens again. So it's the discomfort that allows for the lobster to break the shell and, and continue to grow. Yeah, and in this example, um, I think it was a rabbi, he talks about how if it was a human nowadays, the lobster or that human would never grow because as soon as the human starts feeling some discomfort in that shell, he would go to the doctor and the doctor would give him some medication. Prescribe, prescribe him Not some medication. Not just doctor, but drink alcohol and take drugs. Yeah, and, in the specific yeah, example. Sure. But yes, so... You have to experience discomfort, but I think that the learning process should begin before you start experiencing discomfort. Even though, yes, we could talk about how a baby needs to go through a cold, through a flu, and that's discomfort. But as far as knowledge, as far as what we can learn, as far as specifically thinking of Zanshin, I think that ideally you should start developing knowledge before start being in situations so, so that you're prepared even prepared to know that it's okay to go through yeah. uncomfortable situations but i agree 100 percent. but i think for some people if you take flying for example people fear airplanes so if that person wants to learn just you know watching a video on, on of an airplane that's going to cause some level of discomfort to the person so i think you have to be prepared and and, and i think the example that Pedro gave about the lobster and, and your explanation of, of, of the, what the rabbi said is exactly this point. I think there is sometimes, you know, some, um, some theories that are different that try to avoid the discomfort at all costs. And that creates not the best environment for you to be able to seek that improvement and the truth is that even if we try to create to avoid discomfort at all costs it's yeah, impossible i agree because for example grandmaster Elio used to tell us a story about jujitsu that i don't know if you remember the story that there was a student that was paying for privates and never showing up and paid for the first class it was an intro class private class with Elio grace paid didn't show up so Elio grace called him and said oh i had an appointment i couldn't go okay next week Paid again, didn't show up. It's like, look, I'm feeling bad because you're paying for the class. No, no, please, I'm going to come. Third time, again. And he goes, look, I want to return your money. You're not coming here. And the guy said, finally he came, took the class. And he said, the reason why I was not coming is because I was petrified. I was scared to come here. So sometimes just the decision of putting the kimono and stepping on the mat is already dealing with discomfort. Even if we do everything and we do to make them feel comfortable, for the person, as you said about the airplane, just getting in that airplane to be able to try to fly, just getting into a martial arts school to learn how to defend themselves is already an expression of discomfort and people have to go through that. So you're absolutely right. Absolutely. So anything else on Zanshin? So next. Ready and vigilant. Yes, that's a good one. So, Fudoshin? Fudoshin, balance. Um, I like the quote that we have in the book here, which says, inner peace begins the moment you choose not to allow another person or event to control your emotions. Fudoshin means imperturbability, that nothing can move you from your center an expression of base, an expression of balance. Perspective is extremely important in life. Why is perspective so important? Because we can all look at the same event and react differently. And these emotional reactions can heal and they can also destroy. They can also produce disease. 
these emotional reactions. So Fudoshin is a choice. You say, I want to be calm. I want peace of mind in my life. And then once you make that choice, you start practicing and finding ways, strategies, and it's obviously not easy, to be able to create balance, which is what? Dealing with the stress, dealing with the, the struggles of life with equanimity in an easygoing way so that you're not overly affected. Understanding that being affected can be very destructive to our health. Well, this is the theory, and it's a very important um, theory. However, don't you think that it's, diffi di it's different? It differentiates from person to person, and this is more about how one reacts to different situations based on their experiences, based on their past... Um, I think that we have... Even trauma... Yeah. And even, even genetically. Yes. Genetically, I think we can change our genetics. Right? Really? How? What's well, the... if you understand the study of epigenetics and how um, the science behind genetics have been, has been evolving, so at a, at what we age? Are much more, we're much more in control of our genes than we previously thought. So a child starts already so changing? a deterministic idea that we are born a certain way and we're not going to change is falling apart. That's what was believed before. So we have our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. Obviously, you can make other divisions, but for practical purposes, let's look at, let's divide the mind and the subconscious, the car. You're driving a car, for example. If you're thinking about driving, Zanshin, you're in the moment. So your conscious mind, the frontal lobe of your brain, is connected with the act of driving. You're thinking about holding the wheel, you're thinking about pressing the gas. Suddenly, you remember something, you have an idea, you think of your work, you think of your family, and now your, your conscious mind is focused on something else, and what becomes the driver of the car? The subconscious mind, which allows you to keep going. So when we are not focused in the moment, we are acting in the moment with our subconscious mind. And you need to understand the difference between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is like a computer program. It just runs on the way it was programmed. You have no immediate control over it. Your reactions, how you, your emotional reactions, you said everyone is different. Yes, because everyone's subconscious mind is programmed in a different way. And that programming occurs between the time of pregnancy, when you're in the womb, until the age of seven, more or less. Later, it continues to be programmed, but in a much slower pace. So that programming is different for everyone, and that's why everyone is going to react differently. Exactly. Now, that's now, the point. Now, we don't have to surrender to no, that. No, surrender, no, but understand differences. For example, a child who, at the age of two or three, sits at a table to have his meal in a very calm manner, and is capable of sitting at that table for maybe an hour and a half with maybe a book or just a, a parent or someone who is feeding that child. Um, and you have others who can't stand still. Would you say that one has less food or shame than the other? Or maybe it's just something that this child has no, obviously that, they you can, that you can attribute to maybe genetics? They have less food or shame than the other, for sure, because one is has more the ability of expressing balance than the other. Okay, now, but we then can, we can hold talk on. about why. Let, let, we let can talk just, about the why. Okay, so is let me genetic? just continue. This, okay. So that same child that is very, let's use the word erratic, at the table to have a meal, is a child then that uh, can be in a, in a bridge and would easily jump into the water. Right from a very high. That's not Fudoshin. That's from a, from a very yeah, but is calm. Is not afraid. Doesn't and the other child who was very calm. Jumping. No, but let me just continue. Mm -hmm. So the child who was mm -hmm. very calm at the table, as soon as they see the the height, they start shaking and and they're in great fear. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about a height that is not dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm I'm talking sure. about something that is not irresponsible. The parents are there. So I'm just trying to to to, so to I, pick your brain a bit. So that we can discuss how 
Fudoshin for, for some, and this can continue at an older age as well, can be in different situations, can be easier than for others, depending on the situation. So the point is that Fudoshin is imperturbability. So it's not that you can say this person has Fudoshin, this person doesn't. So the examples that you gave, that one child has more Fudoshin on the table, the other one has more Fudoshin on that situation. It's different situations, different expressions of Fudoshin, of balance. And different so, life experiences in those situations. Sure. So one child is able to be more balanced in face of a danger. The other one is more able to be more balanced in, in, face, in, in eating. But eating is usually, I don't know if it's exactly emotional balance when it comes to eating. Some children eat better or more have a bigger appetite. That, that, that's why I talked about being able and, you know, uh -huh. we're parents now for uh -huh. a child to be calm and restrained at the table and well usually it, the fact that they don't eat is associated to um anxiety even if it's a a, a smaller uh, level of anxiety but they're more restless could be so and and but the point going the, back then the point is that how much do you think the parents so going mm -hmm. back now to your point because i believe even though i'm trying to instigate sure. a few topics for discussion i believe that like you said the parents have a great deal of responsibility and correct. a huge impact correct and sometimes on how these children behave in these two examples in these two different situations sometimes when we say these things it's like oh but you don't want the parent to feel like it's his fault or her fault and feel shame and feel guilt it's not about that i like to feel that i'm in control of things i rather feel attributing it to genetics there could be a small genetic yeah. component but that's out of my control so that i cannot i you know i don't take too much time on that i like to focus on the things that i can control and i like to think that i have as much control as possible and that if something happened it's not about whose fault it is that i have control and maybe i can fix and i can do something to make it better yeah and we should never be trapped right joaquin we should never be imprisoned by oh it's genetics Your dad was like this, your grandfather was like this, so you're going to be like this too. The contrary, if your dad was like this, you have the obligation to be a better version of your dad. If there's something that you can improve upon, right? 100%. And if it was something good? And there's always <laughs> something to improve. Yes. And, and this is our philosophy. Some people now criticize positivity. I believe positivity, and it's connected to the mind as well, is one of the most important things in the world. Being positive, having faith, having a belief that things are going to be good, that things are going to work out, that what you're doing is the best, but there's still room for improvement. Having that mindset heals. It and this is health. very helpful for Fudoshin, right? Correct. Because in moments of crisis, you have to have maybe the word that our teacher really liked was conviction. You have to believe conviction in the sense of believing in yourself. And confidence. Believing, yes, having confidence. Believing that things will work out. And, and especially, go ahead. No, something that you usually like to um, talk about, and I think that you've recently said that I repeat this a lot, is the fact that at least do whatever you can do. Go into whatever situation it may be with that confidence, that conviction that you did whatever was in your power to be ready and to be prepared. I agree. And I think that, you know, in a moment of crisis, You need to be in a state of mind to be able to give your best in solving the situation, in being able to see and being able to analyze. And if you allow your emotions to take over, that state of mind is one that's not possible. And usually the decisions that you're going to make when you allow your emotions to take over are not going to be the ones that are seeking the best strategy, the ones that are the most efficient. So the main thing that I think about Fudoshin is being able to feel the emotion. Some days you're going to feel a little more happy, a little more sad, a little bit dealing with stress, but you're still able to be efficient in your process of making the right decisions. And for that, you need to be able to have control over your emotions. Yes, and having spiritual confidence. Just like you have physical confidence, which minimizes fears that you can have with, re with respect with someone beating you up, someone physically attacking you. When you have spiritual confidence, which is a firm conviction that everything is going to be okay, 
that no matter what happens, everything is going to be okay, then you're going to have less fear. And with less fear, you're going to be less affected by daily events that cannot happen the way that you expected. And then it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. The more experience you have in an uncomfortable situation and dealing with discomfort, the more you're going to be able to, in that moment of crisis, if we use an example, even though Furushin applies in our daily lives, but in a moment of crisis, for you to be able that, to have that calm state of mind, to be able to almost take a, you know, zoom out of the situation and then come up with the best solution for that scenario. So Pedro, Hélio Gracie used to repeat a lot that whatever happened to him happened for a reason. If a brick fell on my head, I would say thank you. He would call it nature. He would say thank you to nature. I knew that I was paying a debt and I could move forward one less debt in my life. He would apply this concept even to death in his own family. Many people today misinterpret that or have a hard time understanding that. How would you explain Elio Gracie's philosophy when it came to dealing with tragedies and dealing with um, adversities with a positive mindset? It was a strategy for preserving his health. Life is a battle. Life is not easy. And it wasn't easy for him either. And we know, knowing him very well, he was a very temperamental person. His emotions were much alive. And he was constantly looking for ways to find Fudoshi in his life. And I saw that as a strategy. Everything that happens is good. What is he telling himself? I'm not going to get upset about anything. I'm not going to allow myself to become angry. Because I see this process in two stages. First, you have to learn how to control your actions. And then, and this is way more difficult, and it connects with flow, and we're going to talk more about that when we talk about flow. But then we have to learn how to control our feelings. Because we want to optimize our feelings. We, want, we don't want to be triggered. So Elio Gracie, He went through a lot of difficult events, a lot of struggles in his life. He developed this mindset where I don't accept anything as being bad. Everything is good. Everything that happens is, is for my benefit, for my spiritual development. And for that, I'm not going to suffer. He still suffered because he was human, but he minimized his suffering. He minimized his emotional um, reactions, thus creating more balance in his life. Couldn't one say that this is repressing his feelings or this was repressing his feelings and that that would be negative? One can say that, but I would disagree because he was not repressing them. He was transforming them. That was his strategy. He was not saying, I don't want to feel angry. He was looking at it from a different perspective. And the perspective is what matters. Would you call that a paradigm shift? Yes, I would. But, Guy, this question is for you. Do you think it's better for you to try to shut down the feeling or to be able to feel it and then you choose what to do with that feeling? No, I agree that Elio Gracie was transforming these feelings into situations that he could learn from it and he considered it to be a debt. Many times he called it a debt. And he often said that no matter how long you live, Remaster Edu believed in, in, in eternal life. He said, no matter what, there's going to be a time where the debt will come. So he was thankful as we understand and he understood that we're not perfect and that we often commit mistakes. Could be small mistakes, could be big mistakes. Of course, we try to avoid the big mistakes. But every event... Every action has a reaction. Every cause has an effect. And he believed that when something happened to him, it was a reaction by nature and the opportunity for him not only to learn, but also to pay his debt. And it's a good thing when you pay your debt. And if someone came and said, okay, let's discuss the science of this. How can you prove? He wasn't interested in that. Because as I said, it was a strategy for him to feel better. Prove your point. 
you know, if you can't prove yours, why are you telling me to prove mine? Let me believe this because this will allow me to feel better. Focus on the positive. Correct. But Focus still- on what can help you. And I think today, Pedro, you mentioned uh, the, the, the science behind uh, so many of the connections between our physical, how we feel, and our mental, the spiritual even um, elements. It's, I would say it's proven. It's proven today that the way you feel, the way you choose to feel, and I think many times it's a choice, directly impacts your health, your physical health, even in preventing diseases. 100%. So, yes, oh, maybe this is wrong. Maybe you should feel uh, sad. Maybe you should suffer. You have the right to try to minimize that as much as possible, and that's good for you. 100%. And I think that that's the point that Pedro did earlier, that you can train your subconscious mind and your conscious mind to be able to transform in a more automatic way. So if you change the way that you start to deal with daily stresses of your life, soon enough, it's not going to be a stress anymore because your body and your mind is already going to react in a way in which you're already going to see that no longer as a stress. So let me do what Guy did earlier. Let's organize it. Flow. That's flow. So let's transition to the next word which Joaquin already did very well and and that's great because we show how all these words are connected so Joaquin was just now talking about how this becomes something natural and it has to be natural as it's the only way for it to really work and I think part of that I was going to complete with one more thing which is as as Pedro said Grandmaster Elio was still humans and we're all humans and emotions are still going to come to us right there's no way for us to be perfect correct We're still going to feel sad. We're still going to sometimes feel stressed with certain things. The question is, once you have that feeling, what do you do with it? And that's where, in my opinion, I think that you have to be able to let it go. Yeah. You learn from it, you feel it, and then you release it. I heard a very good quote um, that expresses that idea that worries or preoccupations are like a bird who lands on top of your head. It's up to you not to allow it to create a nest. The bird is going to land. but Let it fly away. Don't let it create a nest. Don't let it stay there. Don't let it make a home there inside your head. Yep, that's a good one too. So flow, more about flow. First, define it. Make it a little bit easier for us to understand. Mushin. Mushin. Mushin means no mind. So it means that you shut down, you shut off your conscious mind. So we're talking about mind and mushin is no mind. No mind. Because when you're thinking about the mind, you're thinking about... Could it be an oxymoron almost? (laughs) Paradox. Because what happens is this. the, The mind is divided in two parts. And when we think of mind, we think of the conscious mind. The thinking mind. The mind that makes decisions, your wishes, your desires, your plans. That's the conscious mind. Flow is when that mind is shut off. So that's why it's no mind. But then another mind comes in, which is the subconscious mind. And as jiu-jitsu teachers, I'm going to ask you guys, because Joaquin pointed out that it's very difficult. It's easier to control our actions. Also, not easy, but easier to control our reactions. Not the emotional reactions, but our physical reactions. But it's more difficult to control our feelings, right? We still feel, but what do we do with these feelings? I didn't say it's very difficult. I said that it's impossible, in my opinion, for us not to feel anything. There's always feelings. There are levels. Yes. We can feel less. Exactly. And what we do with the feeling. But the point that I'm saying is that Our subconscious mind has certain reactions, emotional reactions. And what does it mean to decide what we're going to do with it afterwards? It means that we're going to have to program our subconscious mind to (coughs) react in a different way, to be less triggered. That's programming of the subconscious mind. And as jiu-jitsu teachers, I'm going to ask Joaquin, 
how do we program the subconscious mind? I believe that the first step is being aware. But let me, let me try to okay. put the question on jiu-jitsu terms. Our pedagogy, our teaching methodology... Repetition. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. That's how you program the subconscious mind. Because the subconscious mind is a habitual mind. It's based on habits and patterns that come from childhood many times and we never change. And many times, through psychotherapy, which is positive, we try to go back and try to figure out what happened in our childhood to create those patterns. But we have to be careful not to go and live in the past too much. The most important thing is to, in the present, let's reprogram our subconscious mind so that we can have better and emotional what is, reactions. And what is your subconscious mind influenced the most every day by? What you see around you. What your your routine. Correct, your routine. So you're not going to change your subconscious mind if every day you wake up at the same time, you do the same exact things, you seek the same amount of information. So I think a great example that I learned this, you know, a couple years ago that was so, you know... Life-changing? Not life-changing, but <laughs> alarming, you know, to think that we do this, and it's true, is that you wake up at every day the same time, usually, then you grab, what's the first thing you grab? Your phone. And then you open up uh, usually your emails or phone calls, text messages, social media. And then you look at those same things that cause it because you follow the same people. And usually you communicate to the same people and you get the same emails that cause the same exact reactions. I don't think emails you. are usually. Yeah. So then more social media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and they have that same effect on what you feel. And then people say, I want to change. Well, but if you do the same exact things every day, you're not going to change. Yes. Because you're, pro, you, you know, you're reprogramming your mind to have the, those same exact feelings based on your routine. So yeah. you got to be willing to change your, your routine if you want to change your life. That's very important. One of the first times I heard about flow was actually through the expression being in the zone. And it was through, I'm not sure if it was Phil Jackson's book or if it was Michael Jordan himself, Phil Jackson, the famous basketball coach, he was the coach uh, that uh, helped the Chicago Bulls win, I think, six titles. Right, Pedro? You yes. remember that as he beat Miami a few times in his way to the NBA Finals? He beat the Lakers too, <laughs> on the first one. But then he joined the Lakers. <laughs> But um, Phil Jackson studied a lot of um, Buddhism, Yes. right? Asian philosophy. Asian philosophy. And there was a, a play. Michael Jordan, you know, grabs a rebound and he dribbles all the way, the length of the court, and he scores. And Michael Jordan talked about how what went in through his mind was absolutely nothing that he could talk about. He said that, He was in the zone. Mushin, no mind. It was no mind. So how do we explain that? It was a su the subconscious mind was in control. It was not his conscious mind. Many times when we're fighting... Go ahead. And why was he able to do that? Because he practiced so many times, repetition, as Joaquin said, it became a subconscious process, procedural memory, as it's called. So our jiu-jitsu teaching methodology is based on that. That's what I was going to touch on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think you can talk about it even better. I don't think so, but I'll try. <laughs> the, when we teach jiu-jitsu, we're teaching people how to fight in the street. That's the definition of fight, of fight or flight. What is fight or flight? Fight or flight is when your, your brain goes into a mode where it's only going to focus its energy on things that are absolutely necessary for you to either escape that situation or... Survive. Survive. Fight, fight the threat. Right? So anything that is not part of that process is going to be shut down. The energy is not going to be there. For example, your immune system. The immune system is not necessary to be able to fight or to survive that moment. So it's not going to work. That's why when you're stressed too much, you get sick. So part of the process that is shut down is your conscious mind. So you're forced to be in a state of mushin, in a state of flow. So now the question is, 
Is your subconscious mind programmed to fight effectively and to survive? So as Miyamoto Musashi says, the way is in training. So our jiu-jitsu methodology, our pedagogy, is designed on programming the subconscious mind. Helio Gracie was a master of that. His process was skip the conscious mind and program the subconscious mind so that in a moment of stress where the conscious mind is not going to be working, the subconscious mind is going to take over. That's why we don't make the teaching process so cerebral through memorization and reading. That can be helpful, but as a complement. The most important thing is repetition to create a subconscious mechanism subconscious response yeah reading is important and understanding the history understanding sure. theory that's all important but we have to understand the difference between situations that you have to prepare for split second decisions correct and that's the question i wanted to ask you so please hold that thought mm -hmm. the difference between split second decisions and moments that you might have time to decide and how does flow affect that um but you said something that Edu Gracie used to uh, discuss a lot, which was the subconscious training for fighting and for self-defense. Our father, he tried to break that down, and he used to talk about how the highest level of Edu Gracie's defensive strategy for fighting was the ability, one, developed after years of practice, to not only anticipate your opponent's attack, which I think in many situations from military to, to business to a simple fight, I think gives you a great advantage. If you can anticipate someone's next move, that's great. But our father talked about how Edu Gracie, and that was something that he interpreted and they discussed it a lot over the years, Edu Gracie, through his muscle, muscular um, relaxation, I think that could be used. He developed the ability to anticipate his opponent's intention, not just the attack itself when the attack is already imminent, but he felt his opponent's ideas. So almost spiritual, but it wasn't. It was through feeling the muscle. I think animals have that ability. You know, we like to study the discovery when it was the discovery channel, right? You feel even the, the heart rate, the eye motion, certain gestures. Nonverbal cues. Nonverbal cues that give you this ability. So let me talk about that. I think this is so interesting. This is fascinating. And, and, and that's something that people are going to have to know more about in the future. Elio Grace's genius when it came to what you just described so well. Very few people know that. His defensive system, based on all these elements that you described. I and think let, let me just give a quick disclaimer. Many students of Elio Grace, and we were one of them, we always want to, to change, we always want to improve, right? That's something that is part of uh, a jiu-jitsu's... Uh, someone that practices jujitsu, that's what you want to do, right? This constant pursuit to perfection and trying to, to find better ways to apply techniques. But Edu Gracie always said, be careful, because as I'm getting older, I'm getting weaker. And as I get weaker, I need more technique. I need more ju. I need more the essence of jujitsu. So many times the improvements and the changes that were made by even disciples of Edu Gracie and Edu Gracie would tell us that himself were based on strength and athleticism. But that's because they're operating at a different level. At a different frequency. A different maybe. frequency. What you explained right I, now... I, I don't want to take you away from no, I, I, your I, point. But I think it's important that we talk about this because it relates to the, to the point. A lot of people, when they think about jiu-jitsu, they're op operating at a different frequency and they can't really see the value of what Edu Gracie was doing. Edu Gracie was operating at a very high frequency and his lessons were at such a high level that it was difficult to understand because of the concepts you just described of how by being relaxed you're able to feel and that connects with what Joaquin said earlier and right when we talked when we started talking about flow Joaquin said well but this connects to awareness 
And I think awareness is the first step. You need to be aware in order for you to know. In order for you to make a conscious, for you to become consciously aware. Because only then you can create a strategy to be able to improve. The subconscious mind will not do that for you. The subconscious mind only acts upon the way it was programmed. It has to be a conscious effort, a conscious decision. To kick I, it off. I want to be more calm, for example. I want to be more balanced. I want to have more fudoshin. And in order for you to be able to understand your emotions, your deep emotions, you have to be in a state of relaxation. You have to be calm. And you have to breathe. You can achieve that sometimes through meditation or just going to the beach, being in front of the ocean, taking deep breaths. Yeah, breathing is key. Is key. Being out in nature is also key. Breathing fresh air. And then being able to look inside. You have to take a deep journey inside yourself, inside your psyche. So that you understand what is triggering you. Because we all have these feelings of anxiety, we all have this sensation inside our chest, sometimes in our throat, where we are sad, where we are upset, and we don't know why many times. We just feel like that. So we need to pause, we need to be aware, we need to be relaxed, we need to breathe, so that then we can figure out what happened, what is causing this exactly. What is the reason why I'm feeling like this? And then usually you're going to start figuring out. And it's interesting that when you figure it out, usually you think, but it's not that serious. But it's still triggering this. Why? Because it's a subconscious programming that comes from before. And that you have no control over. And for this you need honesty. Correct. Because a lot of times when we ask ourselves that question, there are easier answers for us to Blame, give ourselves. Blaming others. Blaming others, blaming situations. Yes. So you, you really need a very deep level of honesty for you to bring out the source of the problem. So then when we find the source of the problem, which is very difficult to do, what's the remedy? What's the cure? The real cure? Not taking a, a, a drug or a medicine or something that's going to mask. mask. What's the real cure? How do we program our subconscious mind? That's the million dollar question. Billion dollar. Yes. Tri Trillion. Priceless. <laughs> Exactly. There's no price. No price. Money Peace of mind. Does not there's no price. Solve this issue. The, the question is, once again, Joaquin said, how do we program our subconscious mind? Through repetition. You can go back to Christian Larson 100 years ago and you can talk about Bruce Lipton, uh, The Secret, right? The book and the, the documentary. It all leads you in the same direction. Positive affirmations. You need to reprogram your mind and through repetition you have to visualize those situations that are triggering you and command your, because the subconscious mind is programmable. You can instruct the subconscious mind on what you want it to do and how you want it to react. And through repetition it will change. So you need to tell your subconscious mind, I want to react this way. When Something triggers me. The same event that is triggering me to feel anxiety, instead of anxiety, I want to feel a calm feeling inside my chest. So you're doing your job, you're going through your day, and suddenly you receive an email or a text message attacking you and someone who's very upset at you for something that you know you really didn't do anything that justifies that type of behavior. Sometimes things just don't work out. So you have your sense of justice, so, indignation. You're like, how come this is not fair to me? And, and then you feel... No, my question is this. So past that point. Mm -hmm. So you know that you have no control over others and usually that's... Uh, their opinion. That's, yeah. And that's a reflection of their state of mind. At, that, at that moment, there's nothing you can do. You're going to feel it. But how do you prepare? Because assuming mm -hmm. that you're not going through that on a daily basis, right? take our experiences here as jiu-jitsu teachers. Thankfully, we don't have yeah. too many in the almost next year you're going to celebrate. We will celebrate 30 years 
Um, first time you taught was in 1993 here in Miami, right? Yes. Uh, we all began teaching, helping our teachers in, in Brazil. No, and also when I start teaching, you guys are already involved in that process in so many ways. So it's... it's yeah. This, yeah. But 30 years since you taught your first class. And in these 30 years, Pedro, I think it's a handful of times that we've had, sure. you know, certain complaints, you know, someone who... Usually parents that are not connected to the school, you know, we can maybe yeah. remember a couple of them. Um, anyways, and you're like, you receive an email and, you know, we're teaching jujitsu. We, we, we have our relationship with jujitsu and we know how much that has changed the, the, the destiny of our life through now four generations of our family involved in, with jujitsu. So how do you prepare for that if that's something so rare so that's what i was saying you have to program the answer is to program your subconscious mind and how do you do that specifically at a time where you are relaxed because someone who does bad things consistently they might have the advantage that they're ready for <laughs> you know <laughs> used to on, on a daily basis they're getting people complaining about this or that but yes. if you don't really the, give people a reason to complain and it happens so uh rarely but there's a lot of people that deal with this every single day and, and still, every single and day they're triggered. still yeah. in a level of yeah. stress, of and anxiety. They, and then of, they have to go home and drink wine so they relax. Every day, they, every night they do that. It's a, it's, a, it's a, as you said earlier, it's a pattern, it's a routine and if you don't decide to change it, it's never going to change. But what's the answer? Because so I, I have an answer also so I want okay, to hear my, your answer. So it's about programming the subconscious mind. It's about positive affirmations and repetition. So when you are at a moment where you are relaxed, a moment where you can breathe and meditate, you're going to visualize the email, you're going to visualize the phone call, and you're going to try to talk yourself through that phone call. You're going to talk in your mind what the person would say. Pedro, you guys teach only this yeah. grappling thing, and yeah. you guys are not tough. There's no punching. There's no kicking. I don't see my son, you know, doing a, a thousand push-ups every class. You know, what about that? What is this art? You know, how come you guys are doing? So then I talk to myself in that way, and then I instruct my subconscious mind to react in a calm manner. You're going to be calm. This is going to happen. You're going to be calm. This is going to happen, you're going to be calm. This is going to happen, you're going to be calm. You visualize the problem and you tell your subconscious mind to be calm. There are some studies that show that this process can work even better in the moment when you wake up, the first few minutes, you know when you wake up and you're still a little bit dazed? And in the moment right before you go to sleep, also when you are in that same stage of relaxation, that in that moment you are more open to, be, to have this subconscious programming. So some people, they put some audio of positive affirmations during that moment. But these are all strategies to program the subconscious mind. I see. So Joaquin, Joaquin, you're not a good teacher. You know, I'm disappointed. You know, my son's been here for six months, but, you know, I, I would expect him to now be a, a monster and... Uh, a phenom and this and that how come he's not how come somebody else is still tapping him or you know? i'm working very hard to making your son's <laughs> ability to defend himself better every day and and i hope that i can continue to do that and but going back to the question that you initially asked pedro on how to train for that not so much related to the moment i didn't ask you what would you say I, i'm i'm asking yeah, yeah how to deal with it how to yeah. deal with so, it internally yeah so I think that what Pedro said is, is, is amazing. But I think that I don't know anyone that has a perfect life that you're still not going to have problems every day. There's problems every day, little problems. Even if you go to the, the smallest things that still disturb us. Those are the opportunities that we have to be able to, the moment that it happens, the moment that you feel that you, know, you shifted 2% on your emotional control based on a situation, you can repeat the things that Pedro said. Because I think that in the morning and in the night, Pedro, I'm more of the belief that it should be only positive things. You shouldn't even bring but those. that's positive. Positive affirmation. But that's what I'm saying. Only positive affirmation. You don't have to think of the person disturbing you and then no, no, no. giving an answer to that. I, I think I it's important. I think I it's know, very important. But, 
But I, I'm sure. You know, I, Hold I, on. Think, I, I didn't really understand that. So you're thinking of what bothers you and then you transform yes, I'm it. I'm training my reaction. To, I'm yeah. doing, for example, in Jiu Jitsu, you throw, I need you to throw the punch so I can repeat the, the right. defense. Yeah, so I think that, thing. you know, you're going to have the opportunity to do that every day because every day there's still things happening so in your life. So what do, you, what do you do if that thought comes to your mind? During the day? No, no. Exactly what Pedro recommended at night or in the morning. So, but I was no, not, so but at, I, at night, at night, I prefer to just think about gratitude, think about abundance, think about uh, all the positive things I did during my day, all the positive lessons that I received from my students, all the positive conversations that I had with friends of mine. Only think positive things. Okay. At the same time that I wake up, also. Yes. So let me just say this. We I, we're already we're already past the just real quick the time. So I I think that Joaquin has a a, a valid um, strategy. My opinion is that in the moment you can train your reaction, which is extremely important. But you still have the feeling, and the only way to not or to minimize because it's not like either you feel or you don't feel. We're trying. It scales, right? We're trying to to get better. And I think the only way for you to reprogram your subconscious mind in order to be able to feel less, to be less affected, is to actually, just like we practice the sucker punch defense, punch, I block, punch, I block. I need to do that when I'm alone in meditation so that my feelings can be more controlled at that moment. But the person that is vibrating those positive feelings every day they are more prepared to be able to deal with that. The person who is in a state of mind of abundance, the person who's in a state of mind of happiness, of joy, of love, is going to have a harder time to be disturbed by someone, by their comment or something like that. Just so you understand, when I'm doing those exercises, I'm completely in a state of mind of positivity yeah. and abundance. It's very similar, yeah. very similar strategies. What do you mean by abundance, exactly? That you believe that your life is going to have all the great things, as many we'll as have, possible. We'll have, no, that you have. That you have already. Exactly. Yes, very good point. In the present. Even if you don't, even if everything is going against you at that you moment. You do, but you, you do. do, you still have. Got it. Great. That was the three. So, Zanshin, Fudoshin and Mushin, we choose to uh, define it or to translate it with awareness, uh, emotional balance, and flow. Correct. So thank you very much. Don't forget to share this with your friends. Please like it if you like it and turn on the notification bell. That helps us. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon.